Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. Anti-Semitism and bigotry are on the rise across the nation. We've seen these manifestations across social media, in the language of politicians, and in violent acts, including at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and at the white supremacist protest in Charlottesville, Virginia. But we have also seen hate speech on our own campuses here in Nevada, at our own public institutions of higher education. Most recently, anti-Semitic graffiti was found at one of our dorms at UNR. Bigoted messages appeared at UNLV's immigration clinic targeting our undocumented students. And racist messages appeared at UNLV's library threatening our black students. Words matter, but condemnation matters too. Hate crimes not only threaten those individuals and organizations on the receiving end, they threaten the very basis of our pluralistic society. We must remember that for all of us, we must stand up and speak out against hate speech in any of its forms, whether it's a swastika inside a bathroom stall or a hall dorm room, or bigoted language directed at our black, Latino, Muslim, LGBTQ, and other diverse populations. We are here today thanks to the leadership and generosity of U.S. Senator Harry Reid, who's had the foresight. <laughs> and conviction of a leader in this nation to stand up against hate speech. Now he's passing that mantle onto us, our student leaders, faculty, and administrators. I am proud that in the room today, to learn from this conversation, we have students and faculty from all of our Southern Nevada institutions, including UNLV, the College of Southern Nevada, Nevada State College, and Desert Research Institute. To help us with this today, Southern Nevada welcomes two of the foremost experts on anti-Semitism in America, award-winning author and historian Deborah Lipstadt and acclaimed journalist Jonathan Wiseman. Many people played a role, thank you. Many people played a role in helping our speakers uh, to UNLV today. I'm especially thankful of Boyd School Law Dean Hamilton and his staff, UNLV President Marta Miana and her staff, the Nevada Regional Office of the Anti-Defamation League, the firm Brownstein, Hyatt, Faber and Shrek, the College of Southern Nevada, Nevada State College, and the Nevada System of Higher Education and the Board of Regents. And again, I want to thank Senator Reed without whose leadership and generosity, none of this would be made possible. I'm proud that the Nevada System of Higher Education is here to support Senator Reed, create and put on this event. Thank you, and now I'll turn it on to Dean Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Riley. This is an important event for our university, for ENSHI, and for our community. The, this university and this city are made better by coming together to discuss critical issues like the rise of anti-Semitism, its causes, its manifestations, and how we can work together to combat this ancient and still very modern hatred. Above all, I want to thank, as the Chancellor did, the one who truly made this event possible, our great friend, Senator Harry Reid and Mrs. Landra Reid. Thank you for being here today. We will hear from Senator Reid in a few moments, and I want to sincerely thank him for continuing to serve Nevada, and above all, our students. I'd like to recognize our co-sponsors for this meaningful and timely event. We have uh, people from the great firm of Brownstein Hyatt. Thank you for being here today from Brownstein Hyatt. Excuse me, Brownstein Hyper Fiber and Shrek, because I think Frank Shrek is in the crowd today. Uh, thank you, uh, President Marta Mayana from UNLV, and Provost Diane Chase for being here today. I want to thank Nevada State College President Bart Patterson for joining us here today. Thank you, Bart, and our partners at the College of Southern Nevada, and welcome to uh, UNLV, I think for the first time, uh, President Federico, Federico Saragossa. Thank you, President Saragossa. I also want to thank our co-sponsors, the Anti-Defamation League of Southern Nevada. Thank you, Executive Director Jolie Brislin. Where's Jolie? Thank you, Jolie. And I want to thank the Nevada system, system of Higher Education Regents here today. Regent Sam Lieberman, thank you, Regent Lieberman, for being here. <laughs> Regent Carol Del Carlo, who's here, thank you, thank you, Regent Del Carlo. Regent Jason Geddes, or Jason Geddes, thank you, sir. And Regent Kathy McAdoo, thank you, Regent McAdoo. And Regent Perkins, thank you, Laura Perkins, for being here. A late addition, great to have you here. 
I also want to thank Representative Shelley Berkeley, who might or may not be in this room. Thank you, Shelley, for being here today. I hope so. I want to thank Dane Hudson from Senator Jackie Rosen's office. Uh, is Dane here? Thank you, Senator Rosen, for supporting this, as well as uh, Victor Ross from Senator Catherine Cortez Mastow's office. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if we have representation from Representative Lee's office uh, or Representative Horsford, but they've been big supporters. You'll find their letters in the program. I'd like to thank our friends from Jewish Nevada, Executive Director Stephanie Tuzman and Board Chair Marla Letizia. Where are they? There they are. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank former Supreme Court Justice Michael Cherry, Judge Ron Israel, Judge Vincent Choa, retired Judge Jennifer Tagliati for being here today as well. And finally, I'd like to recognize my uh, fellow Dean, Nancy Usher from the College of Fine Arts. That's it for the thank yous. Thank you all for being here. Now, please join me in welcoming uh, our host and the one who really did make this possible, Senator Harry Reid. Dean, thank you very, very much. Um, I'm glad that Frank Schreck has helping us with this event, but he hasn't uh, admitted publicly that he's alumni of the same high school as Landra and me. So, for, <clears throat> do, do appreciate his uh, law firm's generosity to help this event be possible. I grew up during World War II. I was a little boy. And my uncles, Joe, Jeff, and Doug, went away to fight in the war. I didn't know anything about that. They came home. There was a celebration as well as Searchlight could have celebrations. And uh, we were glad they came back. But I really didn't understand for many years what they had done. As time went on, as I became educated, I learned that they had been fighting Hitler. They were fighting anti-Semitism with the recognition of the horrible things that led to what we call the Holocaust. I've been involved in public life in Nevada starting in 1963. And during those many decades, I've traveled Nevada extensively and going to Congress where I served for quite a long time, I uh, traveled the country. And never in all my travels did I hear a single slur that was anti-Semitic. No one accosted me at the town hall meetings, the speeches I gave. Now I'm not foolish enough to think that there wasn't some anti-Semitism out there, but I never saw it. And so, as I've watched what has happened recently worldwide, we've seen a rise in anti-Semitism. And sadly, it is here in Nevada. Now over here to my left, you'll see some posters. We could have put a lot more up there, but depicting some of the hate that has been uh, involved in our university campuses. Uh, university of Nevada, here at University of Nevada at Las Vegas, two Jewish young women put their mezuzahs on their door, and they weren't happy with just spray painting it. They carved a swastika on their door. At UNR, there's been a rash of anti-Semitic events. At Juniper Hall, one of the large donatories up there, spray painted with swastikas, uh, with the very direct words, kill all the Jews. Um, in the Fine Arts Center there, they had a large swastika, and with a sign above it, it said, is this political enough? Uh, we've seen this, sadly, close to home. And Bernie Sanders came and visited with Landra and me, uh, a few weeks ago, he left there to go give a speech at a gathering in Henderson. It was a large gathering, but there on the front of that gathering was Bernie with a great big swastika. Now, and I will say this, the only press outlet that covered that was the Nevada Independent. I'm glad they did because one of the pictures we got came from them. So I would hope that people understand how important it is that we speak out against this. Um, I believe that um, we must, whether it's at a concert, a ball game, whether it's a party at your house, 
whether it's with just your family, when we hear anti-Semitic hate, speak out against it. Don't let it go away. And we have it. There are other forms of hate, and I understand that. But today we're going to talk about hate that's been around far too long, and it's raised its ugly head all across America now. And so we're going to have to do something about it. I'm very happy that you are going to be educated with two of the finest people that I could think of bringing to Las Vegas to talk about anti-Semitism. Um, Deborah Lipset is a renowned professor, Emory University. Remember, that's Jimmy Carter, where he still has his, his center there. Um, she, is a, she teaches modern Jewish history. She is one of the foremost experts in the world on the Holocaust. She was involved in litigation that took several years in Great Britain, where a man sued her for uh, claiming he was defamed because she called him a uh, neo-Nazi. Uh, a denier, and the court went on and took a while to write the result, but they came back and said the plaintiff lost, and she, she did not defame him, defame him. He was a neo-Nazi, and he was anti-Semitic. So she's got a lot of courage in addition with her academic background. <clears throat> Jonathan Wiseman has worked in a number of with great publications, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and I'm sure I've missed a few. But he's now with the, the eminent newspaper in the world, and that's the New York Times. I remember my days in Washington where we would do our uh, stakeouts, that we, as we call them, and that myriad of uh, faces and cameras there, and his face was there. That face wasn't nearly as gray as it is now, but it was still there. <laughs> He's written a book on anti-Semitism. It is a stunningly good book. And one of the people today, at an event I was there earlier, a few minutes ago, said that the only book he can remember in recent years where he started reading the book and couldn't put it down. It is that readable, and I would recommend this book. My favorite line, and I've told him this several times, he quotes someone there that said, if there's nothing wrong with the Jews, why were they forced to leave all those countries? Right? So, I'm very happy to have these eminent experts on something we need to talk about. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here. It's also a bit of an emotional day for me, and someone, in fact, who came up to have their book signed before uh, reminded me that today is April 11th. And in April 11, 2000, there was the judgment uh, that Senator Reid just referred to, uh, read by the judge to uh, 350 pages, he read the last 50 pages or so, to a packed courtroom, uh, finding me not only not guilty of libel, but finding, as Senator Reid said, uh, David Irving to be a neo-Nazi polemicist and Holocaust denial to have no basis, in fact, but to be fanciful. So it's a momentous day, and I'd much rather be spending it with all of you than sitting in my, lo in my home, in my study, writing away. So it, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to start in a way that I don't usually do with a joke uh, because I think it encapsulates so much of what we're going to talk about today. And that is a joke that was first told to me uh, when I was in the Soviet Union, the late unlamented Soviet Union, um, visiting refuseniks, Jews who had tried to get out of the Soviet Union but were refused permission by Soviet authorities to leave. Um, and, one, and, and they dealt with it in, in many different ways, but one in a typically Jewish way uh, by telling jokes about it. And the joke they told me was that uh, word went out in Moscow that a store was going to receive a shipment of shoes. Well, if you ever visited the Soviet Union, you know that uh, despite being, calling itself a worker's paradise, uh, consumer goods were in very, very short supply. So people heard this, that the next day the store would have shoes. People lined up. It was a January day freezing. They lined up in the middle of the night to make sure that they would be first online to get the from the shipment of shoes. 
um, and they waited and they waited. Finally, about 10 a.m. after waiting, I don't know, five, six hours, the manager came out and said, we're not going to have enough shoes for everybody online. All the Jews go home. Jews don't get shoes. So the Jews left at 10 a.m. Two, two hours later, people even more frozen. We're not going to have enough shoes. All non-party members go home. So the non-party members went home. We're not going to have enough shoes. All non-veterans of the Great War go home. And as it went on the day, and they were getting colder and colder, and different groups were being sent home, finally, at the very end of the day, the manager comes out and says, we're not going to get any shoes today. Go home. So two of the most uh, venerated groups, um, as the two members of that group, the decorated war veterans, they're walking away from the store frozen solid, and one says to the other, those Jews, they have all the luck. <laughs> I start with this because it shows the illogic of anti-Semitism. In anti-Semitism, we're essentially talking about a conspiracy theory, a prejudice, prejudge. Don't confuse me with the facts. I've made up my mind. I know that Jews are X, Y, and Z. And very often what Jews are accused of being is contradictory. They are accused of being clannish, always sticking together, or of pushing themselves into places where they're not wanted. Or they're accused of being capitalists, Rothschild, Soros, whatever, or they're accused of being communists. Well, last time I checked, it was impossible to be both clannish and pushing yourself into places you weren't wanted, or capitalist and communist at the same time. But that's typical of a conspiracy theory. It needn't make sense. It has to be something that you can rely on to explain an inexplicable situation and often a situation which has caused you some harm, some dislocation. Who can I blame it on? And if you were to blame it as another joke that was told by Jews in Germany, um, a sort of points to of the Nazi official who comes to speak and he's haranguing about the Jews are a misfortune, the Jews have caused this problem, the Jews have caused that problem, and someone yells out, and the bicycle riders. And the man, the Nazi turns to the man where the voice came from and says, why the bicycle riders? And the voice says, why the Jews? It doesn't matter that there's no logical explanation. You pick something that makes sense to people. Now, what is it about anti-Semitism? And when I say makes sense, you, I put it in quotation marks. The anti, every, every prejudice has a stereotype. If I'm being racist, let's say, towards African Americans, there's certain elements of that stereotype that will be there. Awful words, shiftless, lazy, gangs, thugs, whatever the words might be, those are words that are associated with the prejudicial elements towards African Americans. Similarly, with uh, 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 gay people or with uh, people of other, other ethnic or religious groups. And what are the stereotypes, what are the memes, the tropes that we associate with anti-Semitism? There are essentially three or four of them. One, money. It will have something to do with some sort of financial manipulation to a power that exceeds what you would think they have. Small in number, nonetheless able to uh, get things to happen their, their way. An intellect, smart, but in a nefarious, malicious, diabolical way. And cosmopolitan, not cosmopolitan in the way, oh, he's so cosmopolitan, you know, et cetera, but cosmopolitan in that they have ties to one another across national boundaries um, in a way that makes them more loyal to one another than loyal to uh, their fellow citizens. And they have the ability to make themselves unrecognizable. And this goes back to some degree to a Christian theology, they are like the demon. The demon can recreate himself so you can't recognize him. But the demon is behind the scenes, pulling the wires, causing things to happen, causing harm to good people, and so it is with Jews. I mentioned George Soros before. Soros, the financier, becomes that behind the scenes uh, person. It is age old. It is rightfully called the longest hatred, the oldest hatred, as uh, Senator Reid said in his opening remarks, and it has morphed. 
starting from uh, uh, Christianity, morphing into a secularism and anti-church attitudes, those who hated the church of Voltaire, but nonetheless engaged in the same, using the same anti-Semitic tropes to a Karl Marx who was a, a fierce opponent of anything to do with religion, who engages in the same anti-Semitism using those same tropes, those same uh, stereotypes. So we see it all around and we see it consistently. So that someone can make an obnoxious remark or someone can make an obnoxious remark that is anti-Semitic in content, in, um, in its intent. Now, I mentioned before about uh, anti-Semitism being a prejudice, prejudge, don't confuse me with the facts. It, like racism, but I wanna contrast just for a moment racism and anti-Semitism. Two horrific prejudices, but different. And you know what we saw that to a certain extent? We saw this, and I think Jonathan will speak about it more, in Charlottesville. When, when um, those marchers were marching in, uh, chanting, Jews will not replace us. What did they mean by that? Well, the anti, the, the racist, and often, when I'm talking about the racist and the anti-Semite here, generally it's one and the same. And you know what you'll also often find? There's misogyny. That is a very strong element of this as well. Um, but the racist looks upon the person of color, the black person, the brown person, and says, they, they're, they're inferior to me. They're inferior to me, the white Christian, often male, but they're inferior to me. And yet, they seem to be replacing me. They seem to be gaining power. An African-American president, uh, members of Congress, the House, uh, CEOs. But they're, they're lesser than. So how is it possible that they are able to gain this power? There must be some force helping them do that. Who could it be? The Jew. That's why the Jews will not replace us. They are, they are the, 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 again, the, in Pittsburgh, they're bringing in those hordes of refugees, hordes of immigrants, swarms, whatever. The, and, and what did he cry as he was being brought down by the SWAT team? You won't destroy the white race or something to that effect. So the, anti, the racist punches down the anti-Semite, again, one and the same person generally, punches up. Um, now, uh, I'm going to leave it to Jonathan to, to explore more anti-Semitism on the right, but today we're seeing anti-Semitism both from the right and from the left. And there's a terrible tendency of people on the right, Jews and non-Jews, to see anti-Semitism but only on the left. And for people on the left, Jews and non-Jews, to see anti-Semitism, but only on the right. They're both seeing what's legitimately there, but they've got a blinder over one eye. And that's what we call the weaponizing of anti-Semitism. They are seeing the anti-Semitism that is there, but they're seeing it in a political context, a political context that reaffirms their own beliefs. And this is, this is a disaster in the fight against anti-Semitism, and it is a disaster uh, simply because it's a weaponizing and the politicizing of um, anti-Semitism. On the left, there is a tendency, on the progressive left, not all left, not all progressive leftists, but if you use the UK, lab, the United Kingdom's Labour Party as an example, but you don't have to, you can come to this side of the pond and see it through here with some progressive leftists. There's a tendency to look at prejudice, to, the, the view of the, some progressive leftists, and again some, is to see prejudice through a prism. And remember high school physics, a prism bends light? And the prism has two facets, wealth or economic status and ethnicity. And they look at the Jew and they see a white person. Ironically, the right doesn't see it that way. They see a white person who is privileged, even though many Jews are not privileged, it doesn't matter. So they say, ipso facto, therefore, you as a white privileged person cannot possibly be a victim of prejudice. Therefore, you must be making this up for some other end. 
to destroy Jeremy Corbyn politically, to achieve your own political aims, to defend Israel, whatever it might be. And I, as a progressive leftist, I could never be prejudiced. That's impossible. So that's how we see it on the left where it's institutionalized and on the right where it's more violent. And again, Jonathan, I know, is going to address that. The last thing I want to, want to make two last points. Um, there's a typology of anti-Semites. And I, I sort of sketch it out in my book. Um, the extremist anti-Semite, we all recognize that person. The Jews will not replace us person. The person, you know, uh, who engages in overt, unequivocal anti-Semitism, like David Irving, the man I faced in court. But there's also the dinner party or the salon anti-Semite. The person who says, oh, our firm just hired a young new associate. He's, he's, orth he's an Orthodox Jew, but he's very honest. Or the, the one instance in my life where I encountered anti-Semitism, teaching at the University of Washington, um, the first person ever at that university in 1974 to have a position with Jewish in the title, modern Jewish history was, my, was the area I was to teach, professor of modern Jewish history. And I came and it was a great match. Um, uh, the crowded classes, Jews, non-Jews, white, everyone. And, and I was writing and I was an active member of the department. And towards the end of the year, a colleague took me out and said, come out for coffee, I want to tell you something. And he said, I have a confession to make. When I heard that you had been hired, I said, oh my God, we've got a New York Jewish woman. <laughs> he said, what have we gotten ourselves into? He's paused and he said, but Deborah, you are terrific. You're the best thing to ever happen to this department. And I just sat there flabbergasted thinking, I just heard the most anti-Semitic comment, uh, but it's coming to me as a compliment. You know, it, it, it reminds me of what Frank Foyer, who writes for The Atlantic, uh, defines a philo-Semite, an anti-Semite who likes Jews, you know. Um, but, but that's the dinner party anti-Semite. Then they're the anti-Semitic enablers who themselves may not be anti-Semites, but in their rhetoric, in their actions, here I would see Jeremy Corbyn on the right, Donald Trump on the left, um, and, and I'll, I'll be able to get more into those details later if you want, um, who in their actions, in their words, I don't know what's in their heart, that's between them and their cardiologist, you know, uh, but, 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 but their actions, their words, their failure to condemn, their justification enables anti-Semites. It's the wink, wink, nod, nod, um, dog whistle kind of anti-Semitism. And finally, the clueless anti-Semite. The person who makes the comment, we have that with racism, we have many forms of prejudice, not even recognizing how they have absorbed anti-Semitic tropes and then express them um, in a way that is, is horrific, but they, they aren't even aware of it. Uh, my final point with this I close is that the fight against anti-Semitism, you may be concerned about anti-Semitism because you're a Jew. And that's important, but not a sufficient reason. You may be concerned because you have Jewish relatives, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, grandchildren, in-laws, whatever it might be. A good reason, not sufficient. You may be concerned about anti-Semitism because you hate all forms of prejudice. A good reason, but not sufficient. The reason to be concerned about anti-Semitism is that no healthy democratic society can abide a conspiracy theory based on such hate and consider itself a healthy society. If it accepts that conspiracy theory, it will expect, accept all sorts of other conspiracy theories, and then democracy is in danger. Thank you very much. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, you and LV. And I just really want to thank Senator Reid. You know, I, I, as Senator Reid hinted, I covered him for a very long time. And I got this text out of nowhere that said, from somebody I didn't know, saying, Senator Reid wants to talk to you. And my first thought was, oh, no, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's been a year now since the publication of my book, Semitism Being Jewish in America in the Age of Trump. And I have to tell you that between the time that I finished the book and that 
pause before it actually hit the shelves, I really worried that I was going to come off as an alarmist. Um, that after Charlottesville, Donald Trump would say, oh my gosh, look at the, the bigotry that has been unleashed by my movement. And the big uh, social media platforms would have squashed the alt-right. And we'd all be singing Kumbaya by the time my book came out. Um, but I have to say that a year after publication, um, that book, not to toot the horn, because there's not much to toot, um, is uh, proving more prophetic than passe. I mean, every time I think that we've gotten a handle on this, something happens. Pittsburgh, Ilhan Omar's blurted bigotry about dual loyalties, and then Christchurch, New Zealand. I want to read one short passage uh, from my book about um, Zoe Quinn, who was uh, a video game designer, believe it or not, but she was one of the first victims of the swarming hate on the internet uh, that, that I suffered. She is convinced that the great leap forward from the private quarters of Stormfront to the public chat rooms of YouTube, Reddit, and 4chan is a real threat, an avenue for proselytizing by the evangelicals of hate. The more you hear these completely ass-backwards, ridiculous notions, the more you believe them. It's repetition. Young people start out on these sites trying to be shocking. But if you joke about something, like ironically being racist, first, it doesn't minimize the harm, and second, it's like saying, fake it till you make it. Eventually, you start believing it. If you lie face down in the puddle, eventually you're going to breathe in some of the water. Now, I want to read you an email that I received just a few days ago from somebody who's been lying face down in the puddle. Hello, I am a Christian Gentile that has been a huge supporter of Israel and the Jewish people all over the world. Because of their role in the Bible, I held them in high esteem. I've never had a Jewish friend or spent much time with Jews, but that really didn't matter. But what I see now, though, is a concentrated effort by some in the Jewish community in America and Israel to replace white Americans with people of color from other countries. I have done extensive research on this, and it is real and very frightening. Many people are waking up to this, and they see what's happening. Now, I'm not associated with violent people, and I think we can work this out in a nonviolent way. Number one. Jews need to stop advocating for mass illegal immigration and mass refugee resettlements. Number two, Jews need to provide reimbursement to the U.S. Treasury for all the wars we have fought on behalf of Jewish interests, reparations to America for the manipulation of us to pay and die for your wars. Three, cease and desist and apologize for Jewish attacks on Christians in our churches. Jews are not victims. We know what has been going on. This is not the 1920s or 30s Germany. We can work this out peacefully, no violence. Just become aware and stop doing these things that are destroying America. God bless you, Lauren. We can work this out peacefully or not peacefully. So where is this all coming from? So if you look around this audience, Many of you, I'm sure, are advocates of social justice, of welcoming the stranger, of what we Jews call tikkun olam, repairing the world. But what we have seen all these years as altruism, as works of good, have been twisted into a nefarious provocation of hatred. When Robert Bowers took his AR-15 assault rifle into that Pittsburgh synagogue, the slaughter was a shock, but it should not have been a surprise. The acts that we Jews see as central to our faith, charity, civil justice, welcoming the stranger, have been twisted into a threat to white people, into white genocide. The hatred is so deep, so angry, so visceral, and in this violent society with so many guns, it just seemed like that was inevitable. And the same can be said all the way on the other side of the world for the shooter in New Zealand. For the first time in my life, I don't, for most of my life, I didn't think very much about this. I grew up in Atlanta in a very reformed synagogue in a moderately Jewish household. I mean, I was bar mitzvahed, but the synagogue had this bizarre uh, 
arc that, that came down electrically and sh light shot out of it. Um, <laughs> when my daughters were born, they weren't very Jewish, I must admit. High Holy Day services, Passover at Bubby and Zadie's, the occasional Shabbat dinner because they like challah. My point is this. I was actually a pretty typical Jew of my generation, which is to say not particularly Jewish, until I was. In May of 2016, Donald Trump was marauding through the Republican primaries, and a Brookings Institution scholar named Robert Kagan wrote a column called, This is How Fascism Comes to America. And as I do a lot, I took a little snippet of it, and I shot it out onto Twitter. And I got this odd reply back from somebody calling himself Cyber Trump. It just said, hello, Weissman. That's it. But Weissman were in these weird three parentheses. And, you know, my name sounds Jewish, so I kind of intuited this must be something anti-Semitic. So I said, care to explain, Cyber Trump? And he came back, what ho the vaunted Ashkenazi intelligence? Ha ha. It's a dog whistle fool belling the cat for my fellow goyim. And then this absolute onslaught began. And let me describe what it is. Belling the cat, as I learned later, meant that some enterprising young Nazi um, or a uh, member of the alt-right, that strange agglomeration of racists and anti-Semites and white nationalists and misogynists and America firsters, had created a little piece of software. Called, it was available on Google, a Google plugin called the Coincidence Detector. Now, Google didn't know that they were actually peddling this because what, what's a coincidence detector? But if you downloaded the Coincidence Detector, you could search out targets. In, on Google searches, I didn't know this either, you can't search for punctuation marks. But if you have this plugin, you can search for this one set of punctuation marks, three parentheses around a name. So if an enterprising young Nazi, like Andrew Anglin, who's the editor of the, the Daily Stormer, picks out a Jew, say Jonathan Weissman, and puts three parentheses around his name, He's kind of broadcasting out to all his followers to attack, and they attacked. They attacked and attacked and attacked. I got thousands of messages on Twitter, on Facebook, in my voicemail, and it just went on and on and on. Now, people often ask me if I was scared. Um, and I have to say, I wasn't. I mean, I felt like I wasn't going to let some two-bit cyber Nazi get me down. But I am scared now. After Charlottesville, after Pittsburgh, after Christchurch, you should be too. Beyond violence, the trafficking of anti-Semitic tropes is now mainstream. President Trump, in this city last weekend, called Bibi Netanyahu your prime minister to a gathering of Republican Jews. They also cheered. Chuck Grassley used the hoary anti-Semitic trope that left-wing provocateurs these time, this time uh, uh, rallying against Brett Kavanaugh, were professional provocateurs hired by a Jewish financier, George Soros. Trump said that Soros was financing caravans of migrants heading to the American border, and no one really blinked an eye. Which brings me to the anti-Semitism of the left that Deborah was talking about. When I wrote my book, I have to admit, I gave short shrift to this phenomenon. I addressed it a little, but I felt like it paled in comparison to the rise of the violent white nationalist movement. My views are changing on this. I was in Orlando recently uh, for a book event, and somebody uh, who was a threat analyst came to talk to me, and she said that I was right that white nationalism is the most immediate threat. In a violent, gun-saturated culture, that's where murder happens. But, she said, anti-Semitism of the left is definitely on the threat matrix. So let's break down anti-Semitism of the left. First, there is the gutter bigotry of Louis Farrakhan, which is no better than the filth spewed by Richard Spencer or David Duke, and it should be forthrightly condemned, just as we condemn them. But in assessing threats, you have to consider where power is rising. Louis Farrakhan, from his south side of Chicago mosque, can't muster 100,000 fascists to the streets of Budapest like Viktor Orban can. He cannot pass a law in parliament declaring it illegal to even suggest that Poles had anything to do with the Holocaust. 
He cannot win a plurality of seats in the Italian parliament. He will not be runner-up in the next French presidential election, and he will not seize the presidency of Brazil. The nationalist right is a global movement from Manila to Milan, from Budapest to Brasilia, from Warsaw to Washington, and yes, in Jerusalem. Left-wing anti-Semitism is real. I'm no longer one to dismiss it. And when a member of Congress can say Israel is, support for Israel is all about the Benjamins baby, or that pro-Israeli lobbyists are you know, saying it's okay to push for allegiance to a foreign country, those are tropes so well-worn of Jewish money controlling foreign policy, of Jewish dual allegiances, they're too redolent to sweep under the carpet. And if and when Jeremy Corbyn comes to power in prime, as Prime Minister of Britain, I will shudder and reassess. But at this point, I don't see this as a violent movement, at least in the United States. Then there is BDS, boycott, divest, and sanction Israel, and the broader rise of anti-Zionism. Certainly, anti-Zionist movements on college campuses can stray into bigotry and intolerance and can make Jewish feel, students feel extremely uncomfortable, even hated on campus. Holding Jews everywhere responsible for the actions of a government in Jerusalem is collective punishment. So if I was walking down the street and I saw a Muslim woman in a hijab and I walked up to her and berated her for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, or I said, how dare you blow up that car bomb in Afghanistan? You would call me a racist, and you would rightfully call me a racist. So holding every, any Jewish student on the campus of UNLV responsible for the death of a protester in Gaza is an anti-Semitic motion. It is collective punishment. We should not accept that. That said, I want to tell you about my stepdaughter, Hannah, who is a sophomore at Barnard. She was bat mitzvah. She was confirmed. She loves being Jewish. She was extremely Jewish identified, but she really does not like Israel. Young Jews of her generation did not grow up knowing labor and Likud. They don't remember Camp David or Oslo. They don't remember the assassination of Rabin. All they know is Netanyahu, who just won a re-election to a fifth term, and they don't like it. If you want to call Hannah an anti-Semite, that's your right. She won't listen to you. If you want to engage her in policy, I think you should. If you want to explain to her why Israel has a right to exist, she will listen to you. But calling her an anti-Semite will get you nowhere. And what worries me is that making young Jews answerable to Israel is driving them away from Judaism altogether. If we say that being Jewish, by definition, means supporting the government of the moment in Jerusalem, that young Jews must choose, embrace Israel or walk, I can tell you a lot of them will walk. And that is what really worries me the most right now about the future of American Judaism. I simply don't believe that the young Jews having, I mean, young college students having these very heated arguments over Israel are the same violent threat as the self-radicalized men like Robert Bowers or the shooter in New Zealand. I want to be clear about one thing here. I am not saying that the response to the rise of anti-Semitism and alt-right bigotry should be the uniform adoption of left-wing politics. Some of the most articulate and passionate denunciations of our drift toward intolerant authoritarianism have come from conservative Republicans, especially conservative Republican Jews like Bill Kristol, Max Boot, Brett Stevens, and the late Charles Krauthammer. The defense of American institutions, such lefty concepts as the US Constitution or the rule of law or US law enforcement, these are not, should not be considered democratic or Republican endeavors. There are certain lines that neither party is supposed to cross. Bigotry, racism, authoritarianism. That's not liberal or conservative, it's American. But remarkably enough, calling out anti-Semitism and bigotry in the age of Trump has become controversial. I believe that explaining what's happening, understanding the enemy, should not be controversial. 
It's critical. Over the past years, as Deborah was talking about, I've been amazed about how many people don't understand why those kids in Charlottesville were chanting, Jews will not replace us. People know to recoil, but they don't understand what it means. We should. You know, I'm often asked, how can you insinuate that Donald Trump might be an anti-Semite? He loves Israel. First, I do not say that Donald Trump is an anti-Semite. Like Deborah said, I don't know what's in his heart. But I would like to take the latter part of that. Loving Israel, strangely enough, is not necessarily inconsistent with modern anti-Semitism. On the contrary, modern white nationalists often revere Israel as a model ethno-state. They say constantly that they don't hate black people, that black people should just live in Africa. They don't hate Latinos. They should just live in Latin America. And they don't hate Jews. Jews have their own ethno-state, Israel, so they should live there. In his rambling, I know that Deborah doesn't want me to call it a manifesto, but his bizarre Q&A, the shooter in New Zealand asked himself, are you an anti-Semite? To which he answered, no, a Jew living in Israel is no enemy of mine, so long as they do not seek to subvert or harm my people. So speaking out isn't something that should be tolerated. It is something that must be encouraged. Now, I'm going to close on with the words of my own rabbi, Dan Zemel, um, on Arab Rosh Hashanah. He said, and I'm reading this not to ratify it, but to say, that even rabbis can speak out from the, from the pulpit. He said, we are now living in a world where our narrative is daily mocked, contradicted, refuted, held in contempt, and made to appear trivial. The very root of the way we understand the world and the purpose and dream of America we hold dear is scorned daily. And for us to make matters even a tad more unbearable, there are fellow Jews involved in this contempt, Jews near the seat of power forging these sins. In my darker moments, or perhaps my more lucid ones, I dream of excommunication of those who, like Esau, live lives in defiance of the birthright they have inherited. The counter-narrative of our country that we are now grappling with is an American story of closed borders, racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, and misogyny. So I'm going to bring you right back to the congregation that I grew up with in Atlanta. So in Octo on October 12, 1958, a group of white supremacists calling themselves the Confederate Underground exploded 50 dynamite sticks in a recessed doorway of the temple. At the time, my rabbi, uh, well, <laughs> he was died by the time I got there, Rabbi Rothschild, gave a sermon called, And None Shall Make Us Afraid. But the really lasting words came from Ralph McGill, the editor of the Atlanta Constitution, who wrote the words of the re-emergent citizen of the world, where identity is both universal and non-existent. You cannot preach and encourage hate for the Negro and hope to restrict it to that field, he wrote. When the wolves of hate are loosed on one people, then no one is safe. When the wolves of hate are loosed on one people, then no one is safe. Thank you very much. Set or not? Okay. <laughs> Everybody knows I don't need a microphone. Uh, thank you very much to our speakers. I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, but first, I am curious uh, if either you want to respond to anything either of you said. Um, I, I tend, on, the, on most part, to agree with Jonathan. Um, I wrote my book after Jonathan. I was able to cite his book in mine, so I thank you for that. Um, but I, too, uh, and my book only came out two months ago, uh, but I finished it. If any of you, I know there are many people here many, who have probably written books. You know that there's a long lag time between the time you hand it into the publisher and the time uh, you actually see it. And I handed it in, I would say, uh, August, 
uh, or July, and then I got it back from my copy editor in late August. And uh, usually when you get a book back at that point, you're, you're making minor changes. The, the accepted rules, you're not making massive changes unless you've talked about a certain kind of cancer and they've discovered the cure in those two months, then you should mention it. Um, but um, I said to my editor, I've got to add things. In the past two months, we had the Polish Holocaust law, the revisions on the Polish Holocaust law. We had a, uh, a Jewish survivor of the Holocaust uh, killed in her apartment in uh, Paris. We had the more revelations about the UK. We had Benjamin Netanyahu make a welcoming Orban to Israel as a fighter against anti-Semitism, which he's not. Um, and we, so she said, okay. But finally she called me and she said, Deborah, you've got to send it to us. It, it, if it doesn't go into production right away, we're not going to have it when it's supposed, and it's in the catalog, et cetera, et cetera. So I added one paragraph before I hit send, and that was, um, I had written that this was a hard book to write because it wasn't about history, it was about the present. It was a harder book to finish because of all these new elements, and then I added the following paragraph. Uh, though I'm not a, a prophet, I'm a historian dealing with what was. I'm willing to prognosticate that by the time this book appears, something will have happened that should have been included. That was September 18th, and then five weeks later, we had Pittsburgh. So this is a fluid situation uh, that even those, both of us, two people sitting up here who immersed themselves and studied this topic and wrote about it, feel events are outpacing us. Thank you. And I do want to point out that both of these terrific books will be for sale after the talk at the reception. So, to what extent do you think this is a worldwide phenomenon? Particularly, what are your thoughts on Europe? And is Europe a cautionary tale for what might happen here in the United States? Um, I think the situation is, and my guess is Jonathan will agree, if you know what's good for you, you know. <laughs> um, we're staying in the same hotel. I know where he. I know where to find him for the next 12 hours. Um, the situation in Europe is a little different. It's more overt. The anti-Semitic acts there, the violent acts, have t tended to come from Islamist extremists. The, the, ironically, and I never really thought about it, the right-wing extremists there are more structural. Uh, they're the political parties you mentioned, uh, um, the various, uh, you know, Orban, Poland, uh, uh, um, Italy, etc. And the other thing you have in in Europe is you have large segments of um, Muslim populations, and I want to be very careful here because I don't want to draw with a broad brush, uh, many of whom would never dream of doing anything violent to Jews or to anybody else. But they have absorbed, whether from the mosque or from social media, certain of the tropes, the memes that I've been talking about, about Jews that were never part of Muslim culture. Muslim culture looked at Jews in, as a much lower uh, caste, as the same way they looked at Christians. But they didn't have those traditional um, anti-Semitic characteristics that I laid out at the beginning, and you find them having been absorbed. Um, and the day-to-day anti-Semitism uh, exemplified, and I know the Times wrote about this, by a young Israeli Arab who was living in Berlin who had gone back to Israel to visit his friends, and he, his, one of his Jewish friends gave him a kippah and said, but don't wear it in Berlin because it's dangerous. So he thought this was ridiculous. He decided to try, put it on him in, in, in walk the streets of Berlin, and he got beaten up by a Syrian refugee. He knew it was a Syrian refugee because he could tell from the Arabic accent what it was. So, and you have many of those kind of instances. So I think in Europe, the situation is quite different. I, don't I mean, I, I, I would just piggyback on what Deborah said. I mean, the, the difference is, one of, one of the very big differences in Europe, and one of the reasons why uh, kind of anti-Semitism of the left is so prevalent there is that there is this large um, Muslim immigrant population that the left, um, the left-wing parties, especially the French left, have used uh, to, to manipulate. That basically, that that they have they have a, a body of voters that's large enough, and that's large enough to be of uh, to be worth. 
appealing to with anti-Semitic and anti-Israel rhetoric. So, you know, in the United States, we don't really have a, a population like that that's really worth chasing, right? I think it's a big deal. But, but, I do think that the leaders of the Democratic Party in the United States are looking at, the, at what's happened in the, in the Labor Party of Britain um, with great trepidation. Because the fact is that the Democrats, uh, the Democratic Party in the United States is, is increasingly um, part, the, a big part of the coalition, the Democratic coalition is uh, immigrants. And when you look at an Ilhan Omar or a Rashida Tlaib, um, look, these are, these are uh, first generation uh, Americans. Um, Rashida Tlaib's mother is Palestinian. Amer uh, is Palestinian. Her, uh, uh, Ilhan Omar came over from Somalia. And when they talk about Israel and sometimes use anti-Semitic tropes, um, these, uh, you know, this, at this point, this is a fairly small population, but that population will get larger. And uh, the, the Democrats really do need to worry or, or, or think about how to, um, how to absorb uh, immigrant voters without allowing that insidiousness uh, from Europe to get, to get into the, the, the center-left party of the United States. You know, it's interesting what you just said, because I was thinking about it. As I mentioned to you earlier, I was recently in London, and I spoke at JW3, which is the sort of the JCC, a cultural center uh, um, uh, in, in London, Jewish cultural center in London. And a woman raised her hand and said, I've been a member of the, she looked like she was in her early 50s. Uh, I was, uh, I've been a member of the Labor Party for 30 years. My parents were committed to the Labor Party. We felt the Labor Party really represented the democratic values, uh, fought on behalf of working people, Jew values that were so close to us as Jews. She said, I don't feel like I can be part of that party. Yet I look at the Tories, and I don't see myself as part of that party either. I feel like I have no political home. And I think for a lot of American Jews, if the Democratic Party goes in the direction which the leadership of the party doesn't want it to go in, that's going to happen because they're going to feel like, I don't want to be part of the Republican Party, even though uh, Donald Trump has done things which are supposedly good for Israel or whatever, because that's so closely aligned with these Jews will not replace us right-wingers that you write about in, in your book, and that I also discuss in my book. Um, but where do I go? And that's so strange, because 60 years ago, my parents, uh, parents of many people in this room, your parents, were, were choosing their medical schools on the basis of which ones would accept Jews. Were choosing their colleges on the, uh, uh, universities which they have Jewish presidents had real quotas. You know, uh, uh, Dartmouth had a Jewish president who had a menorah collection in the entryway to the president's house. Dartmouth used to be one of the most anti-Semitic schools around. So things have changed so much. And Jews feel more integrated into America than ever before. Yet on the political end, for many people, they're going to feel, potentially feel homeless. Well, I, I, I'm sorry to leave you out of this conversation, Dean Hamilton, but <laughs> I do want I do We're happy to good I, uh, time. I, I, do think, I do think that this does bring up this very important conversation about the generational divide among American Jews and how we can differentiate between anti-Israel sentiment and anti-Semitic sentiment. Um, actually, uh, somebody gave me a question that I actually wanted to bring up because I think it's something we really have to address. Um, let me read it. It is, why is questioning and having a conversation about Israel's policies and actions, e.g. E settlement, example settlements, toward Palestinians regarded by many as anti-Semitic? Is opposing policies in the current state of Israel anti-Semitic? No. And I think we need to talk about that. So let, why don't I, I put that to you? Okay. Define, define where, where, where anti-Israel sentiment ends and anti-Semitism ends. Easy. 
Criticism of Israel, of a country's policies, is not being anti that country. In the case of Israel, if you want to read criticism, you want to see criticism of Israeli po policy, I've got two suggestions. Go to haaretz.com and you'll see criticism, or especially with the new Knesset that's just been elected, go to the floor of the Knesset, you have to understand Hebrew, but when they stop screeching at each other, you know, and you listen, you'll hear real criticism of policies. That's not anti-Semitism. And I don't think there are, there are some extremists, fanatics, whatever, but, but you know, cr cr considered by many, show me the many who consider criticism of that poli those policies to be ipso facto anti-Semitic. It's not. Um, just like criticism of American policies doesn't make you anti-American. What does, where, where does it change for me, the dividing line, and here actually we may differ, is A, when you take a myopic view and only see human rights abuses in Israel. You don't see China's abuse of uh, Muslims. You don't see Myanmar's abuse of the Rohingya. You don't see abuse of women in many, many Muslim countries. Uh, you, don't, you, you miss all that. You only see the greatest human rights abuser is Israel. Or you make the argument that Israel was founded on the notion of the uh, destruction of, or the dislocation of another group. And it's true that uh, during the 1948 War for Independence, Israel's War for Independence, uh, called the Nakba by the Palestinians, um, there were many Arabs living in what became Israel who left because they were told by Arab leaders, leave now for two weeks, three weeks, you'll come back, you'll inherit that will get rid of the Jews, you'll get their businesses, their homes, their orchards, just get out of the way so we can fight them. But there were other um, groups of Arabs who were pushed out by Jewish fighters in a very, today would, would, would horrify us when you, when you, when you see the details. Um, and so people will say to me, well look, this con that country was founded on a dislocation of a people. It doesn't have a right to exist. And I will say, Let's con contextualize that. Let's think of other countries that were founded on dislocation of people. And we can start, it's, 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 it's not really amusing, but it is, a, it is ironic. The United States of America with our treatment of the Native Americans and slavery. I, go to, I teach in a school where buildings were built by slaves. Um, Canada, the treatment of I think what they call the First Nation there, the indigenous people. Australia, the treatment of the Aborigines. New Zealand, the treatment of the Maoris, a little better than the Aborigines, but not that much. Um, there are lots of, and no one questions those countries' right to exist. Maybe there should be reparations, maybe there should be um, a, a, an acknowledgement of that. But I think, again, when you take that myopic view, or you take the myopic view that all the wrong is only on one side, um, then I have to ask why. What's going on? If the only place I see human rights abuses is by Israel, and many of the people who make that argument can't even find Israel on a map. It's hard, I know that, it's little, uh, but you should be able to if you're gonna uh, uh, um, criticize it. That's when I have to wonder what's going on here. So that's where I get to the point Something else is going on. Something else, maybe it didn't start out that way, but something else has been woven into it. Thank you. And I do want to recognize our good friend and the president of Toro University Medical School, Representative Shelley Berkeley. Thank you for being here today. So I've got lots of questions, but I can also open it up. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, 
Don't be anti-acne, you know? Uh, so. We've all been there. All right. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm going to answer that briefly, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan, because his whole, much of his book is about that, that threat that comes from the web. Um, there are people now, serious people, who are arguing that um, where, they, where many of these web, these platforms or uh, uh, internet sites started out as we're just here and you can put anything on us, recognize now that they have to take a much more proactive uh, view. And I think more, there's more than one group. There are quite a few groups and quite a few groups studying it. I know ADL has just come out with a study by Joel Finkelstein of Art Artificial Intelligence and, and how that uh, is being used, you know, what that, how that plays into the, to the web. So it's very much there. Um, and I think it is a major concern. Um, and it is given, when I started to work on Holocaust deniers in the late 80s, early 90s, if you wanted to get Holocaust denial material, you got it in a plain brown envelope in a post office box, because in most cases, post offices wouldn't deliver it. Today, you just go to Mrs. Google and, and you'll find it there very easily. So it's, we live in a different world, and I think that the internet sites were slow to pick up on what, what the, their impact is. But Jonathan, you want to speak to that? I could talk all day about this, so um, let me just quickly talk about some things about this. First of all, it used to be that the kind of Nazis and bigots and racists uh, had their own little websites. There was Stormfront, there was the Daily Stormer, there was, they, they talked to each other within their own little ghettos on the web. Um, and then something happened in around 2013 called uh, Gamergate. And remember I, I said that, read that little passage from Zoe Quinn. There were about three or four women who were video game designers who had the audacity to design video games uh, that didn't involve like running over prostitutes with your car or shooting, you know, a few thousand people. Um, and there was a group of young men living in their parents' basement uh, who decided that with pimples that the uh, that that these women video game game designers had to be destroyed. Uh, and what they did was launch Gamergate, which was to attack these women. Um, they doxed them. They got their they got. Uh, personal information, social security numbers, bank records, they put them out on the internet, they wrote these salacious, uh, awful stories about you know, their sex lives. They just tried to absolutely destroy these women, and they really pretty much did. Uh, and within very quickly, um, all these little neo-Nazis in their little websites looked at the Gamergate guys and said, oh my gosh, these guys know how to use the internet. They've weaponized it. And that's where they learned how to do the attacks, the swarming attacks that they have. Now, how many of you have heard of a guy named PewDiePie? All right, more than usual. <laughs> so, <laughs> PewDiePie um, is actually the most famous uh, YouTuber on, in the, on the planet. Uh, millions of people watch this guy. He's a young 20-something uh, Swede. And, um, it was one episode of, of PewDiePie, he was talking about this website called Fiverr where for five bucks you could hire somebody basically to do anything. And he had hired uh, these guys um, called the Crazy Guys, I think. Uh, they were these two Indian guys and he had hired them on a secret mission. Um, and he was doing his silly thing on the internet and he was uploading a picture, of uh, a, a video of the crazy guys and he said, I asked these guys, oh, no, they'll, they won't do what I ask them to. Oh, I know I just threw out my five bucks. Let's see what happens. And then he gets these two guys, these two Indian guys who are dancing around and they're fighting over some piece of paper and you can't tell what it was. And finally, they, un they unveil this scroll of paper and it says, death to all Jews. Now, PewDiePie acts all embarrassed. Oh, I can't believe they actually did it. But for literally tens of thousands of 14-year-old boys, that was the very first time they ever saw the term death to all Jews. So it used to be that you had to go out and seek this stuff. But now the, the purveyors of hate have learned that you take the hate where the kids are. 
you take it to the chat rooms of 4chan and 8chan, you take it to uh, Google Hangouts and, 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 um, and the, the, co the commentary rooms in YouTube, and kids are running into this. It's almost, it's almost impossible. I mean, my, the reason I know about that PewDiePie thing is that my daughter, who's now in college, she's 19, when I was writing the book, she, she told me, she told me, Dad, you got to see this. She's not a PewDiePie fan, but she just ran into it. It's out there, and I will tell you, if you try to suppress it, you try to suppress it, it'll pop up somewhere else. It's like whack-a-mole. You, you know, remember, t Twitter did a, not a great, but a pretty good job trying to suppress the kind of neo-Nazism that, that we saw in 2016. They did such a good job that they went out and created Gab, which is uh, another social media site where they are all openly talking about it. It's where Robert Bowers, the gunman in, 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 uh, in, in, in the synagogue in Pittsburgh, found um, his community and told everyone what he was going to do. So it is a really, really difficult problem, and it cannot be understated how insidious it is. You know, this, uh, so you, the, your story about PewDiePie and, and, and its impact on 14-year-olds, and you probably read this, you're in D.C., but about two weeks ago, there was a story in, I think the Post, I guess it was in the Post, even in the local uh, page of the Post, um, about a, a, high, a, a school, a middle school in D.C., a public school, which is pretty much white. You know, even though D.C. is a very heavily African-American, it's a very large African-American population, this particular school had a, a majority white population with some African-Americans. And at recess, a couple of kids were playing football, and whatever happened, happened. And one of the white kids who was playing with a couple of African-American kids turned to them and used the N-word. And then he said, this is a 12-year-old, you can call me a racist, but I don't care. Now, the N-word he might have picked up at home or something, but that you can call me a racist, I don't care. It might have come from home, it might have come, but it was a defiance. And it makes me, it reminds me of what you're saying with PewDiePie, with the, you know, death to all Jews, or this rash of swastikas we're seeing now. The bar has been lowered. It's been uh, against what is acceptable. The bar... Um, has been lowered because of the internet, and it's also been lowered because of the failure of a number of leaders of our country, including the leader of our country, to take a strong stand against this, to say, this kind of stuff is unacceptable. It rather you get, oh, it's a few couple of, couple of people, it's not really important. Well, worse yet, you have the leader of our country, President Trump, talking about... Um, uh, talk, uh, talk, well, talk, talking about political correctness mm -hmm. as this bane of our existence. What, what you know, used to uh, political correctness obviously can go overboard, but now on on the on the right and including in the White House, political correctness is basically anybody who says "don't be rude." I mean, it, it is defiant. It, it, I mean, when the president of the United States is on social media just being rude every single day, it is sending a message to this country and lowering the bar. And I, I, don't, I don't even think that that is a, a, a subjective thing to say. You talk about the physical attributes of people, uh, a representative of Congress, the size of his neck, a journalist making fun of a journalist. You lower the bar. You lower the bar on one kind of hate, all kind of hate, it's, it's exactly, it's rudeness, but that rudeness, and some it will just stay rudeness, but others it will descend in permission to engage in overt acts of hatred. Thank you. So, I'm curious if, if you have a sense of the scale of anti-Semitism in the United States and a sense of the organization, if there is any. Charlottesville had the look of an organized movement. Is that the case, or is that uh, a, a loud minority? How do you assess that? Well, I remember uh, it's, uh, I was actually uh, at a, a, a small, a considerably smaller rally uh, that Richard Spencer and some of his lieutenants were having um, in July of 2017 um, in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And they did, one of the guys uh, there did a call and response who runs the media? The Jews. Who runs 
you know, the, the Wall Street, the Jews. And it was a call and response. And then it ended with, you will not replace us. You will not replace us. And then Richard Spencer gave this very long diatribe. And it, when he ended, he ended, he said, see you all in Charlottesville. Um, and I remember, actually, I had just finished my book. I had sent the manuscript to my publisher, and I had gone over uh, on vacation in Scotland in that August. And um, I was actually in a pub in Glasgow, and I was looking at this image of Charlottesville uh, from the United States, and I couldn't believe it. And I remembered, oh, see you in Charlottesville. I mean, yes, it was organized, but remember, these things are kind of inchoate, and, and uh, Deborah talks about this in her book. Now, after Charlottesville, the leadership and the organization that created Unite the Right kind of collapsed uh, under the weight. And remember, remember they tried to have Unite the Right too the next year. It was a disaster. Nobody showed up. But the idea that you know they've won, uh, or we've won, and they've gone away is ridiculous. They're out there. Um, it's, I think you called it a fungus, right? Or is it I say it's like a herpes. Anti-Semitism <laughs> is like a herpes. If you, it sounds awful, but in fact, it, it, right, the report, one, a reporter from your paper uh, called me on the day of Pittsburgh, and I said, anti-Semitism is like, and I said, no, no, don't write that, don't write so horrible. She said, no, it's exactly right. Why is it like a herpes? Because if, now I think there's medication that can cure herpes, but until very recently, if you got it, it was always inside of you. And we've all heard the horror stories of the bride who wakes up in the morning and has a a giant herpes sore on her lip out of tension, out of stress, or someone's going for a, um, uh, a major job interview when they get a herpes attack um, because it's there and it comes out at moments of tension and it mutates, it goes to different parts of the body. And I think that's anti-Semitism. It's so deeply embedded in society. It's so deeply embedded into our consciousness that, that it's to eradicate it, especially now, as you just mentioned, with the political correctness being seen as something, you know, wimpish and, and uh, not to be bothered with, um, it, it's there. It's there in a very, very prevalent fashion. Prevalent. And one thing, you, you, Dean Hamilton, you mentioned, uh, you asked about organization. I mean, one of the things that really shocked me um, when I was targeted was uh, how organized it was, that there was somebody who created a, a Google plugin. Um, they called it, and it had a name. People were told, knew to go download this. They knew to look to the Daily Stormer to see who the new target was. Um, it's not organized in the way that, you know, there are memberships to the... Like Nazi ISIS party. or... Uh, right. But they know where to look. Like, they, there is... There are, leader, there, there are leaders who are giving orders. Those or... Those, you know, Andrew Anglin doesn't know who he's telling to go attack the, the, the journalists, but he knows there are people out there, and there are people out looking for his looking for his orders. So that was something of a shock to me. And and you sh you can't talk. And I hear this more and more from people such as Jonathan, but others as well, uh, scholars who were studying this. We can't think of the guy in Pittsburgh, or Dylan Roof in uh, Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston or uh, the killer in Christchurch as lone wolves. They may not know each other, and they may not be getting an order from central headquarters, but they're all reading the same stuff. They're all citing one another. The New York Times just last week had a very, or just maybe a few days ago, who the hell knows when it was, um, but a very interesting graphic of how they cite one another. None of them know each other. But, they, but they're not lone wolves. They're not sitting alone in their single room occupancy apartments saying, I'm going to take my gun and go shoot someone. They're inspired. And it's incohate, and yet it's very, uh, very much organized in this, in this new way of social media. How should we confront this in our own lives? How should we take on anti-Semitism? Well, I think one of the things we have to become, and, and Senator Reid was saying this way back at the beginning of this session, um, we have to speak out. We have to become what I described in, in, in Time Magazine right after Pittsburgh in an essay, the unwelcome guests at the dinner party. 
You know, it used to be if you arrived for Thanksgiving dinner, uh, your, whoever made the dinner, usually your hostess, would say, look, we know Uncle XYZ is coming, or not to be sexist, Aunt ABC is coming, and she's a racist, or she's a homophobe, or she's an anti-Semite. She's going to say something. Just ignore it. We're going to have a nice Thanksgiving dinner. And you can't do that anymore. When you, to paraphrase the TSA, um, when you hear something, you've got to say something. Not to change the minds of the people who are saying it. In most cases, that's like trying to push the boulder up the mountain. But to telegraph to the people at the table, especially but not only the young people, that this is not tolerated. That it's not, it's not just the ideas you don't tolerate, but we don't tolerate talk like that. So I think that's one thing. I think the second thing is to take it seriously. Many campuses, it's just, until recently, it's not taken seriously. You know, oh, come on, there were a few swastikas or something like that, but just to take it seriously. I think there are other things too, but, you know. Well, I'd just like to say, and something that Deborah said, I, and I agree with to a certain extent, is that racism and anti-Semitism are different things. But I want to say that, um, we're all in this together. And that, you know, Jews shouting anti-Semitism or African-Americans shouting racism or homosexuals shouting homophobia, whenever they do, whenever we do things like that, there's a tendency for, for people outside to either think, to have two reactions. Oh, you're overstating it, you're drawing, drawing attention to yourself, or you think you have it bad we have it worse. So I would say that the way to confront bigotry, not anti-Semitism, not racism, not homophobia, to confront bigotry is to create alliances. I, it is so much more powerful and it's so much more difficult for blacks and Jews and Muslims and immigrants and Latinos to stand together and say, we're all in this together, we're fighting the rise of bigotry in this country, than for each person, each group, to stand for themselves. And I just, you know, I travel, I've traveled a lot for my book, and I, 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 wherever we go, wherever I go, I'm asked, what can we do? And I always have this answer, and some will say, well, what's going, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Well, in almost every community, there is, especially in the churches and the mosques and the synagogues, there, there are efforts to do this. And I just ask you to go out. I remember I was speaking um, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and before I went uh, up there, the rabbi had said, okay, we're gonna have Jonathan Weissman is gonna speak, and then we'll have a little reception. And afterwards, we're going to have this march through New Brunswick with, the, with this mosque and this church. And we're standing up against bigotry. And, you know, they did my talk. And then somebody stood up and he said, she said, what can I do about this? And I said, your rabbi just said you're having a march against bigotry. <laughs> just join. Join. Thank you. So one of the many ways to characterize Senator Reid's extraordinary career is that he is unafraid. He has been unafraid to have these tough discussions and to bring us together to have these tough discussions and to have essential discussions like this. And I want to thank him for bringing us together. As John, thank you, Sarah. We are, as our speakers have said, stronger together. And thanks to events like these, we stand together. So please join us at a reception where there are books for sale and thank our speakers.